In the first lecture in section 2.4, we're going to be looking at soaps, detergents and emulsions. So the first thing we're going to consider is how do you make a soap? Well, a soap is made by hydrolyzing a fat or oil. Okay. Now, if you hydrolyze a fat or oil with an acid, you break, you hydrolyze the ester link so you'd break the molecule here and here and here, making glycerol and three carboxylic acids. However, if you hydrolyze it with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, it splits the molecule in the same place. You still make glycerol, but the carboxylic acids that you produce then react with the alkali so acid plus alkali to produce a salt and water and the salt because it's sodium hydroxide will be the sodium salt of this long chain fatty acid and that's what a soap is the sodium salt of a long chain fatty acid so here's the glycerol we produce and here's the soap the sodium salt of the long chain fatty acid So we want to look at the structure of soap. So here's two alternative ways of drawing the structure of soap. In the bottom one we've got all the hydrocarbon section clearly labelled and then we have the carboxylate section and the sodium. And in the top diagram the hydrocarbon section is just shown as this zigzag line. Okay. Either way of drawing the soap is acceptable. But the important thing is, in terms of the function of the molecule as a soap, is that we have this long hydrocarbon section. And hydrocarbons are essentially non-polar. So they will not be soluble in water, they will be soluble in non-polar solvents like oil and grease. So this long covalent tail is hydrophobic. So it means it does not like water. Whereas at the other end we've got this ionic head which is very polar and so will dissolve in water. That bit could be described as being hydrophilic. And it's this combination of the hydrophobic tail and the hydrophilic head which allows it to function as a soap. So. Uh, soaps have a long covalent tail which are hydrophobic and an ionic head which is hydrophilic. So we want to look now at how that allows it to function as a soap. Right, got this rather complicated looking diagram but it's not really that complicated. So here's a soap molecule with the black zigzaggy covalent tail and the ball with the minus sign is the ionic head. So if you look down here, we see all the soap molecules, the covalent tail dissolves in the non-polar grease, with the ionic head sticking up into the water. Now, all these negative signs repel each other. So this is quite an unstable arrangement and it starts to pull the grease apart as the negative charges try and get further away from each other to eventually the grease comes away forming a ball okay, so here's one here with the covalent tail of the soap molecule and the grease and the ionic head of the soap molecule round outside in the water and there's no way these uh, balls of grease are going to reform uh, and join together because the negative charges around the outside of this repel the negative charges around the outside of this globule of oil so they stay separated and do not recombine. Now the only problem we have with soap is that if you're using it in an area of hard water, uh, hard water means it contains lots of calcium and magnesium ions, especially calcium, is that the calcium can combine with the soap molecule 
to form an insoluble calcium salt and this insoluble calcium salt precipitates out forming a scum on say if it was a bath for example you get this scummy area all around the bath but more importantly it removes the soap molecules from the water column making them less effective as a soap so in hard water areas instead of using soap we have to use a detergent now there's only a very subtle difference between a soap and a detergent so at the top here we've got a soap molecule long covalent tail ionic head here's a detergent molecule long covalent tail ionic head so the only real difference is the nature of the ionic head in soap it's a carboxylate in a detergent it's a sulfate the advantage of the sulfate is that the calcium salt of this is not insoluble so it works perfectly well in hard water areas but they've got so much in common they've got the long covalent tail which is hydrophobic then they've got the ionic head which is hydrophilic it's just the exact nature of the ionic head that varies slightly okay now we're going to look at the related topic of emulsions now what is an emulsion an emulsion contains small droplets of one liquid dispersed within another liquid so let's use this diagram to help explain that so imagine this is the blue region is an water or an aqueous solvent and the top layer here is your oil an oil or some or non some non-polar solvent they don't mix so they form these two separate layers if you pick this up and give it a good shake the oil will be dispersed throughout the aqueous solvent this is an emulsion however if we leave this to settle the oil will gradually recombine at the top and it will eventually it will turn back to this again so in order to keep it like this we have to add something called an emulsifier now <coughs> soaps and detergents are emulsifiers because that's how they work to remove oil and grease from clothes or whatever but we are really interested in what we use as an emulsifier in the food and drink industry lots of foodstuffs are emulsions for example mayonnaise this is a jar of mayonnaise it's got an emulsifier added and it just looks like normal mayonnaise but if you put all the ingredients of mayonnaise together without the emulsifier this is what it would look like so the oil would separate and you get this oily layer at the very big oily layer at the top which doesn't look very pleasant at all so we have to use an emulsifier but because it's in the food and drink industry we don't want to use soap or detergent because obviously that would greatly uh, ruin the flavor of the food so the emulsifiers we use in the food and drink industry uh, are made by reacting glycerol with edible oils I'll give you an example of one so remember glycerol is uh, your three carbons which this year had three OH groups an OH group there an OH group there an OH group there but some of these OH groups or indeed in this case all the OH groups have been replaced by something else and the structure of this allows it to act as an emulsifier it's got a very polar part in this case the very polar part isn't ionic but it is the hydrogen bonding you get in OH groups so there's various OH groups in the molecule giving it a good strong polar section it's also got a good strong non-polar section you should look out for long chains of carbon and hydrogens for your non-polar section and you'll find that up here okay. notice it says CH26 so there's six CH2 groups in a the row there 
and another 7 CH2 groups in a row here. So there's 6, 13, 15, 16 carbons with all the associated hydrogens in this big long chain. So this acts just like the covalent tail in the soap molecule dissolving in the oil and the OH groups provide the porous part which dissolves in the water. So <coughs> it uh, works in the exact same way as a soap or detergent because this is because they also form emulsions as does this. Okay, four things this time that you should, should be able to do. Uh, you should be able to explain how a soap is made from fats or oils. You should be able to explain the cleaning action of soap and detergent in terms of their structure. You should be able to describe where detergents are particularly useful. And finally, you should be able to explain why a molecule can act as an emulsifier in terms of its structure.